This is the new Bugatti Chiron Super Sport, and it is seriously impressive. A luxury car and a hypercar and one of the fastest, most expensive vehicles on the planet. Almost 1,600 horsepower and a sticker price of over $4 million. And today, I'm going to review it. Before I get started, be sure to check out Cars and Bids, which is my enthusiast car auction website for cool cars from the modern era with free listings. You can list your cool car for free and auction it on Cars and Bids. And we've had some fantastic sales recently, including this wonderful Shelby GT350R sold for almost $68,000. This fantastic 992 Porsche 911, which is wonderfully optioned, brought almost $160,000. $9,000, and this Hummer EV sold for just under $230,000. If you're looking to buy or sell a cool enthusiast car from the modern era, the 1980s and up, Cars and Bids is the place to do it, with daily auctions and great selection at carsandbids.com. So let's talk Chiron Super Sport. The standard Bugatti Chiron is an amazing car with almost 1,500 horsepower and a top speed of over 260 miles an hour. But Bugatti wanted more, more power and more speed. So they developed a version of the Chiron that could go more than 300 miles an hour. This is a toned down version of that car with a little bit more luxury and a little less speed, but of course it's still absolutely insane, and today I'm going to review it. First, I'll take you on a thorough tour of the Chiron Super Sport and show you all of its cool quirks and features, then I'll get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'll give it a Doug score. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Chiron Supersport with the key, which is this. Very simple but elegant key. Bugatti on one side, flip it over and you have just lock and unlock, no fancy special features, and then it's trimmed in leather that matches the interior of the car. Again, very elegant, very beautiful key to go along with this car. But that's not the only key you get with one of these. There's also this. It says she wrote on the side press a button, a key pops out. That is your top speed key. This car can go almost 275 miles an hour, but it won't do that unless you insert this top speed key right here in the driver's door sill area. You stick that in and twist it, and that activates top speed mode. It's like an extra confirmation that you really do want to go that fast sticking in your top speed key, and that basically unlocks the full top speed of the car. Also worth pointing out, there is one other key you get with a Chiron, and that would be a spare, and it's this, just a standard Volkswagen Audi folding key. You press it, it folds out, lock and unlock, the same key you would get in a Passat, except you have it here in a Bugatti. It's laughable to see that carried over part from Volkswagen, but that is the spare key. And speaking of carried over parts from Volkswagen, of course, Bugatti is under the Volkswagen Group umbrella, so it's not that surprising to see a few things carried over, but I only found one other obvious one. When you turn the car on, this little DRL warning light comes on for the daytime running lights. That is exactly the same little light that comes on in the Passat and the Jetta and every other Volkswagen, and it comes on here in the Chiron also, another carryover. Aside from that and the spare key, everything is bespoke to Bugatti. But anyway, next up, before I get inside and onto the little quirks and features, I want to talk through some of the changes to make the Super Sport compared to the standard Chiron. And the most obvious one is back here, and that would be the fact that it's longer. You look in the back and you can see it looks longer, like it has kind of a long tail compared to a regular Chiron, and that's because it does. The Super Sport is about 10 inches longer than a regular Chiron, and it's all been added to the back for aerodynamics. That's because Bugatti got a version of the Super Sport over 
300 miles an hour, which is insane. And at that speed, aerodynamics tremendously important, making the car as slippery as possible. And so that meant adding a little bit more kind of tail to direct airflow and help the car get through the air at a higher speed. Now, it's worth pointing out, like I said before, this car can't do 300 miles an hour. It can do just under 275, but that's still an amazing figure. And it's more than the standard Chiron, which is about 260 miles an hour, and more than the Chiron Pure Sport, which was a handling focused version of this car. That can only do 218. So this is kind of the king of the speed hill at 273, though it doesn't quite crest the 300 mark like a version of this car can do. But on that subject, let's talk about versions of this car. This is the standard Chiron Super Sport, but there's also the Chiron Super Sport 300 Plus, which is modeled after that top speed over 300 mile an hour car. That one is lighter, faster, more exciting. This is more luxury focused. So you don't quite have the crazy performance of the 300 plus model, but you get kind of a compromise, a really high top speed and some nice luxury touches instead. And of course, you pay for it. The base sticker price for a Bugatti Chiron Super Sport is $3.825 million. That's the base price. This one has been equipped to $4.3 million sticker price, so it is a half million dollars in options. And this car is unbelievably expensive, over $4 million for a car. But a rather special one. But anyway, next up, let's talk through some other changes to the Super Sport compared to the standard Chiron. One very noticeable one, these holes on the front fenders. You can see some holes in the driver's side and over on the passenger side, nine holes. They look a little bit odd there, but they are there on all the Super Sport models. And they're intended to pay tribute to the Bugatti EB110 Super Sport, which also had holes. You can see them here. These holes were a very distinctive look on the EB110 Super Sport models, and they've been been carried over to the Chiron Super Sport as like a little tribute, which is kind of cool. Other upgrades to the Super Sport, for one thing, this front splitter is more aggressive than what you get on the standard Chiron, a little bit more sporty, performance oriented, and you also have Chiron Super Sport badging on the outside, although there's not a lot of badging on the outside of this car. So what that really means is Chiron Super Sport on the fuel door, as you can see here, there's the badge, press it, the fuel door opens, and that's where you put in fuel, and you have it over on the other side where you have what looks like a second fuel door. She runs Super Sport, open that. It's actually where you add engine oil. So oil on one side, fuel on the other, and you better keep track of which is which because you don't want to screw that up. Now, one other important change compared to a standard Chiron, the Super Sport has different tires. Bugatti told me regular Chiron can go 260, 261 miles an hour. This does 273. But even that 12 to 13 mile an hour jump required different tires for this car because at that speed, 12 miles an hour is a really big deal. So this has upgraded tires for an even higher speed compared to a standard Chiron, which is pretty impressive. And then there's the power boost. A standard Chiron has just under 1,500 horsepower. This has just under 1,600 horsepower. 1,580 horsepower to be specific in this car, which is an absolutely massive number for any vehicle, but obviously particularly a sports car. Now, it also has just under 1,200 pound-feet of torque, which is also a massive number, and a quad turbocharged W16 engine. You can see it from the back, W16 on one side and 1600 over on the other side. That refers to the vehicle's output in PS rather than horsepower. It's a little bit higher, but you get the gist. It's unbelievably powerful. Now, unfortunately, I cannot show you the engine itself because in a car like this, you can't get in there. This is all one big fixed panel. They don't want people fiddling around in the engine or screwing with the aero, and so that's fixed in place but you can see it kind of from the outside, the quad turbocharged 16 cylinder powertrain. And it's worth pointing out some other mechanical changes to the Chiron Super Sport. For one thing, lighter turbochargers. Better, lighter, it means that power spools up a little bit faster, which is an upgrade for this model. Bugatti also says longer gear ratios and a higher red line, basically a lot of stuff done in pursuit of a higher top speed. Better aerodynamics, changes to the engine, the transmission, all going for a higher overall top speed, which they achieved. 
Also worth pointing out with the Chiron Super Sport, you have a different exhaust than in a standard Chiron. You can see it back here, sort of four pipes, two stacked on each side, kind of a strange look, but a quad exhaust back here, very distinctive, and it sounds surprisingly angry. When you think about this car, you think elegant and luxurious and ultra fast, but this one is mean sounding too. Take a listen to some revs from the Chiron Super Sport. Anyway, next up, there is so much more to cover on the outside of this car, and I want to start with the carbon fiber weave. So, the body of this car is primarily carbon fiber, and the very cool thing about Bugatti is they match the carbon fiber weave between panels, meaning even when the panel ends, they line up the next panel perfectly so the weave matches and continues on, almost looking like it's one continuous weave, despite going over panel gaps, and that is unbelievable attention to detail, which frankly you probably expect when you're paying this much money for a car. Now, another important exterior detail in the Chiron in general is the light bar in back. You can see going across the entire rear, you have one large, long, straight light bar, which is a distinctive Chiron touch and very characteristic of this car. You also have brake lights on either side, of course, and you can see they have this sort of triangular design on top of them, which is also kind of distinctive to the Chiron. Doesn't really change how they look when they light up, but when you see it stop, it's a very Chiron specific design detail. Now, speaking of lighting, up front when the running lights are on, you can see four different squares on each side of the car, which is also a very Chiron specific design detail. But speaking of those four squares, maybe the coolest thing they do is the little dance when you unlock the car. You can see it here, you unlock and they do this sort of dance of recognition to welcome you back to your Chiron, which is kind of a neat little touch for this car. Now, also worth noting around front in the super Super Sport and any Chiron, you have massive grills up here. You can see basically three across the front, including the center grill, which is this distinctive Bugatti design they've had on all their cars going back over a hundred years, that Bugatti shaped grill. But big grills in the front of this car to suck in as much air as possible and try to keep that massive engine cooled. And also worth pointing out, speaking of air intakes, you got another one on the side. You see this curve going down the side of the car. It's a very Bugatti unique piece of design language, but it also hides an air intake. You go up, you can see it, and air comes through here to get to the engine. They're basically trying to get as much air as possible into the engine, including through that air intake in the side. But anyway, next we get inside the Chiron Super Sport, and the thing you notice when you open the door is that you are not greeted by tons of carbon fiber and a sport bucket seat that's hard to sit in and a very uncomfortable race car like interior instead is pretty luxurious in here. Look around and you can see you got a nice interior with wide supportive seats, all leather with stitching and Alcantara and everything looks good. Same deal, leather steering wheel, dashboard center console. You do have some carbon fiber in here as it's the super sport model, but a very luxurious, high quality, high end interior in this car, which is kind of surprising considering it has 1600 horsepower. You'd think it would be some all-out track monster, but that's kind of the benefit of this car. You get the performance, the power, the speed, the acceleration, and the luxury in here. Now, one thing you won't see as you look throughout this interior is a giant center infotainment screen like so many modern cars have. You pay four million bucks for a car and you don't even get a center screen, but that is very intentional. Bugatti assumes that this car will be a coveted vehicle in a collection for years, decades to come, and they figure putting some currently modern screen in the center will just date the car in 10, 15, 20 years. It's going to look stupid, like cars from 20 years ago with screens that were cutting edge at the time now look very outdated. So Bugatti has skipped that, and instead you just have this row of four switches going down the center, four little dials here, and this is your climate control. You can make various adjustments to the climate control here. You can change the air temperature, the air positioning, 
positioning, the airflow, and the top three of these dials, and then the bottom dial controls your heated seat. You can adjust the dial to turn on the heated seat and then press the little arrow button at the bottom in order to change which seat you're controlling. But that arrow button at the bottom has another purpose as well. If you hold it down, you can see all of the dials change. Take another look at that. Holding down the button, the dials have now changed what they're showing, and instead they've become gauges rather than your climate controls. And this is how you get a center screen in a car without a center screen. Suddenly, your little climate control dials now have a second function to show gauges and vehicle information in the center, which is a nice little hidden Easter egg. You want it to go back to being climate controls, all you gotta do is press that little arrow button again, and then your climate controls pop right back up. But in case you're wondering how to control everything else in this car, there are screens built into the gauge cluster, although kind of hidden in there, so they don't make the car seem outdated, like I mentioned. The screen over on the right is the more important one, and you can do all sorts of different things with that screen, including see various pieces of vehicle information, trip odometer, that sort of thing. You can also use it to see your tire pressures and temperatures, which is very important in a car like this, especially if you're doing high-speed driving runs. And you also have a chrono in here a stopwatch you can use if you're like doing drag races or track days to time your laps from inside your car which is nice now you also have the ability in that screen to go into a settings menu which is fairly standard car settings like most vehicles have but the cool one here is you can adjust the displays that show up in your little center gauges so I had it on the classic display and it showed various different gauges like I showed you earlier but there are different modes you can go into for instance you go into performance mode for these gauges and then they show an entirely different thing in the center. Now you're looking at your power and your speed and the gear you're in and that sort of thing and that's a change you've just made so you can see different information in those little screens and there are several different settings you can choose from in the gauge screen to choose exactly what you want displayed in the center which is a pretty cool idea. Now the other screen in this car is over on the left side of the gauge cluster and this one doesn't quite have as much. It has a tachometer as you can see and then various other little items you can scroll through like a digital speed readout a power readout which is kind of cool and a little graphic showing the car if there's any doors open or anything like that maybe the most important item in this gauge cluster area though is the gauge in the center which is of course your speedometer this is a serious thing right in the middle old school analog gauge and it goes all the way up to 300 in case you want to go really really fast in your car you will also see below this gauge you have a digital readout for your speed in case you don't want to try to figure out what your speed is from this gauge while you're going 250 miles an hour. But anyway, next up, some other interesting things in this car. For one, the gear selector. This is a seven-speed dual-clutch automatic like all Chiron models, and the selector itself functions in kind of an unusual way. To put this car in drive, you move it over to the right for D, then you're in drive. To put it in neutral, you move it over to the left, you're in neutral, and reverse is to the left and down, and then you're in reverse. And if you want to put it in park, you just press the top, and that is your park for the gear selector. A little bit strange compared to other cars. Now, one other notable control here in the center console is this power button. That is your stereo control. In the center console, you can only turn it on or off with that power button. That's all you can do. All of the rest of the stereo controls are over on the steering wheel. You can see them here, volume up, volume down, next track, mute. It's all there. But in terms of controls, the passenger has access to only on and off. Now, speaking of the steering wheel, there are quite a few other important items on the wheel worth mentioning. For one, over on the right, you have engine, which is, of course, your engine start-stop. In the center, you have LC, which stands for launch control. That's how you activate it. But maybe the most important item on the steering wheel is over on the left, you can see a little dial with various images depicted. So those are this car's drive modes. EB is at the top, which is Bugatti's logo, and EB stands for the initials of the founder of the company. That's sort of your basic general tour mode for this car. Next, you have Autobahn, which is sort of your high-speed, fast-driving mode. And then at the very bottom, you have a checkered flag, and that's like your handling mode for racetrack driving. What happens when you go into the different modes is the vehicle changes. The position of the spoiler changes, depending on the type of driving you want. The car will lower or raise, get more slippery or less, depending on exactly which mode you're in. Now, it's also worth pointing out there is a fourth diagram here, and that's your axle 
lifter. You move the little wheel over to that and the car will lift itself up in order to clear like steep driveways, that sort of thing. So that's useful to have right there on the steering wheel. Now, other cool stuff inside this interior, there is quite a bit. One, probably the thing I like the most in here, is this curve between the seats. You can see going all the way from the center console between the seats all the way up and then to the ceiling, this one curved piece, which just looks cool. That is a piece of ambient lighting, believe it or not, and you can turn it on or off with this switch. Turn it on for more in-cabin lighting, and then you just have one large light between the seats, which is really cool. And it's important to keep in mind that that mimics the similar curve on the outside of the car that I showed you earlier. That's sort of a Bugatti signature on the outside, so they brought it into the interior as well. Now, the weird thing about this curve being here is that it bisects the rear window. So when you look into your rearview mirror, your vision is basically cut in two by this curve. A little bit of form over function here, but it does look very, very cool. Now, in the vicinity of this curve, it's worth pointing out this car also has dual sunroofs. So you can see over both seats, you have individual sunroofs. These don't come off, but you do have two sunroofs here that you can use to look out, which is kind of a cool touch. As for storage in this interior, well, it's pretty minimal, but you do have some. You got a glove box, like you'd expect from a normal car, although a lot of hypercars don't, but you do here. You also have door panel storage. You pop open this panel, and then you have storage in there where you can put stuff, and there's another door panel storage pocket ahead of that, so there's some storage there. You also have this oddly shapen storage panel in the center. I'm not really sure what that's for, but it's there. And then you have another piece of storage sort of under the dashboard center console area where you can stick some more stuff. Not an enormous amount of storage in this interior, but a decent amount for decent space. This is, after all, the luxury hypercar. Now, next up, also worth pointing out, some super sport touches in this interior. For one thing, on the door sill, it says super sport reminding you you're not getting into some regular, normal Chiron. You also have Super Sport printed on this leather panel in the footwells. See the driver footwell here, Chiron Super Sport, to remind you of your special vehicle. As for materials in here, like I said before, a lot of leather, a lot of stitching, but there is some carbon fiber. That's different from a standard Chiron, which is mostly just leather, but this, being a performance model, adds in some of the carbon, although not quite as much as a Super Sport 300 Plus or a Devo, which are kind of more track focused on the inside. Next up, another interesting item to mention, the stalks coming off the steering column. Turn signal stalk over on the left, like virtually all cars, and it also contains your cruise control, and it's very simple. Just rotate it on or rotate it off, and that's what you have. Plus, a couple of little buttons at the end to help set your speed. Over on the other side, your wiper stalk, and again, very simple, on, off, intermittent if you rotate the stalk, but it's all pretty basic, trying to be elegant instead of, like, overcomplicated. Also worth pointing out, near this vicinity, you can see on the dashboard by the steering wheel, this little hole, that is where you insert the key. You put it in there and then you press engine and that's how you start up your Chiron. But let's talk over one other thing that's accessible from the interior and that would be the front trunk. And to get in there, you pull this little latch in the driver footwell and then it pops open. So let's talk about that front trunk because there are a few interesting items in here. For one, I love the fact that when you open it up, you have the Bugatti plaque in the corner letting you know that you've just bought one of the most exclusive, special, impressive cars in the world. And right next to it, there's just a standard 12 volt outlet. It's kind of weird to see those two things directly next to each other, the exclusivity and then the normalcy in there. But other items worth pointing out in this trunk. For one thing, a Bugatti branded trickle charger, which is kind of cool. Instead of just buying a regular one, Bugatti has their own, which is kind of a cool little touch. You also have a tire changing kit in here. This little piece over on the right side of the trunk, that is a tire changing kit. Open it up and you can see all the stuff necessary for a roadside flat tire repair in your Bugatti Chiron if that were to happen. One other thing I like in the trunk is this warning label that lets you know it could get hot. It says temperatures of over 122 degrees are possible in the trunk. Basically it's telling you don't put anything in here that can't get really hot because it might. However, the most interesting part of the trunk is undoubtedly this 
piece that's just stuck here in the center, kind of breaking up the middle of the trunk. Why would anyone want to bisect their storage area in that way? It doesn't seem like it makes any sense, except that by doing this, Bugatti breaks up this front trunk storage area into two separate pieces for regulatory purposes. And the result of that is that they don't have to install an interior emergency trunk release in this car because neither piece separately is large enough to meet that requirement. If they pulled out this panel, they would have to put in that trunk release, but with it in place, they don't. So they figure most owners will just pull out the panel and the car won't have a trunk release, but they can't sell it that way from the factory, which is kind of an interesting thing. But anyway, last items worth pointing out with the Chiron Supersport. One is curb weight. This car is not intended to be lightweight or light on its feet. It comes in at just under 4,600 pounds, which is amazing. Koenigsegg's weigh a little over 3,000, Hennessy Venom F5 in that same area. So this is like 1,500 pounds more, but you get the added luxury and all the nice touches compared to those cars. So a lot of people will surely find that worth it. Also worth pointing out that the Chiron Supersport is the end of the line for the Chiron, at least according to Bugatti. They say the next version of the Chiron that comes out is called the Bolide, which has already been shown and it's sort of a race focused version that won't be street legal. So this is kind of the last street legal Chiron. So they say future Bugatti models will be plug-in hybrids. They'll have electric electric technology borrowed, I guess, in part from Rimac, which is in the Bugatti family. And so this is kind of the end of the line for this quad turbo W16 all gas powered car, the Chiron Supersport. And so those are the crux and features of the new Bugatti Chiron Super Sport. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the Chiron Super Sport. The end of the line for the Chiron. I've driven a few of these Chirons and a couple of Aerons also. And so I got a lot more experience down than when I first drove a Chiron years ago, but the thrill and the excitement of this car is still here. Um, it is just so tremendously well built. That's one of the first things you notice when you climb inside. Everything is so luxurious, so well put together. The materials are excellent. Everything is nice. And I drive a lot of hypercars, Pagani and Koenigsegg and the Hennessy Venom and blah, blah, blah. A lot of different hypercars and Lamborghinis and Ferraris. And the thing that I always remember about the Chiron and every time I'm still impressed is that it feels like a Bentley in terms of materials quality. You have this fantastic luxury and everything is so nice. Now you pay for that in part with curb weight, but the car is so fast that it doesn't really matter. Um, and it, the, the cool thing about it and the reason that you're willing to make that curb weight trade-off is you get it all. You get the speed, you get the performance, you get the power, and you also get this sort of luxury car feel, which is kind of unique to the Bugatti in the world of the hypercar. The thing about this car has always been the acceleration is just absolutely massive and ridiculous and absurd in every way, and boy does it still feel like that. It is just crazy. You put your foot down and the power just comes and comes. And the interesting thing is it comes relatively linearly. You get smashed in the face from the moment you put down the throttle. <laughs> It's just always there. There's always an intense amount of power. And the other interesting thing is it just keeps coming. There is just seemingly infinite power in this car. Now, interestingly, when you sit at a stoplight in this car, and this is again, one of the benefits of, of the Bugattis, it's just, it's nice. You're sitting here, nothing is rumbling or rattling. You have decent visibility around you. The air conditioning is keeping you cool. The seat is nice and comfortable. It doesn't feel rough or difficult in any way. It, it, it feels nice. All right, so I'm gonna give it a little gas here. Oh. <laughs> Man, it is so, so quick and it's so effortless. You can just put your foot down and just go. And it doesn't feel like some frenetic, like Ferrari F8 where it's kind of loud and it's very precise, but you know, it's kind of just buzzy and all that. This thing just feels like a jet, like it just, takes off and just has power and power and power. And you let off the throttle at speeds that are not legal and I will not disclose, and you still feel like you haven't even slightly scratched the surface of where this car could go and could take you in terms of top speed. It's just nothing compared to what it's capable of. Another interesting thing about this car, I just drove around the highway on-ramp, but I've also spent some time in other Chirons and, and doing various different things. And 
I'm always impressed by the handling of this car. It doesn't feel quite as athletic as something that is truly lightweight, but it minimizes the um, weight surprisingly well considering how heavy it is. Um, and considering that that isn't, when you think of this car, you think about acceleration and top speed. You don't think about it as like a true, you know, throw it around sports car, but it's surprisingly good at that in addition to being good at pretty much everything else. Now the drawback of a car that is good at everything is that you pay for it. <laughs> it's incredibly expensive. Man, the, the throttle response is fantastic. The acceleration is fantastic. It is just so unbelievably fast. Some people complain about a little bit of a turbo lag and you have a little bit of a turbo lag, but really not all that much. And it makes up for it in just sheer insanity right afterwards. And then you get off the freeway, you stop flooring the accelerator and it's like you're in kind of a normal car. Potentially you could forget that you're in such a ridiculous, insane, high performance hyper car, except for the fact that everybody is looking at you and everybody makes it a big deal. Like, wow, look at that. Even here in Orange County where Ferraris and whatever are seen, you know, you see 10 of them a day, you don't see Bugattis and everybody makes sure to look over. <laughs> and point and stare. It really is to me amazing just how effortless it all is. Now having driven all of these cars, some of them have so much of a sense of occasion. This one does also because it's just such a special car, but you really can, it's crazy to imagine daily driving a car like this, but if you wanted to, you you absolutely easily could. Driving some of these other hyper cars is very special, very amazing, but they're difficult to see out of. Um, they can be unreliable, especially some of these really small volume brands. I hear kind of horror stories here and there about problems that some of these cars have. It's not really the case here. Um, this car obviously is expensive to maintain and own and operate, but you got dealership support, you got a big brand that's behind it, and the car is just usable. It just feels like you can drive it like a normal vehicle if you want to, and I think that's one of the real benefits of this. Um, you know, the Veyron was the first hyper car back when it came out, and this is still like the, the most usable, most rational one. Um, everybody else has gone more for the crazy performance, which is amazing. And those Koenigseggs are incredible to drive. They have some amazing detail work and touches. And Pagani's also, but there's just something about the fact that you can use this normally. <laughs> it's just crazy. Like, it's just not how you think about this car, but that's the, the real impressive part about the engineering of this. You can floor it and excel, out accelerate anything else in the world, or you can drive it to the grocery store. I just think this car is so cool. And you know, it's interesting. It, it, uh, it's been out now for, I don't know, five, six years. Um, it's been cool the whole time. The Veyron is the car that has the mystique around it because it was first and it kind of did a lot of things first. It was the fastest car in the world, you know, when that record wasn't really being broken by anybody or really paid attention to and it just did it. And it was the first car for a million dollars and it, it just had all these superlatives and everybody remembers Top Gear and all that. The car was just so special. The Chiron, it's interesting, the Chiron doesn't have the same level of sort of mystique and mythos around it being just sort of the next generation. But it is a much better car. The technology is better. My understanding is that the repair and maintenance is better. Um, it feels more modern. It's faster. I think it looks better. There's just so many wonderful things about it. And I think um, if I were to choose between the two, I'd choose a Chiron in a second. And I just think it's one of the very, very, very coolest cars of all time. Um, and it really fits in with my ethos too, because I don't love like buzzy, low, annoying, difficult cars. And this kind of lets you have the performance. It lets you have your cake and eat it too. It lets you have the performance without putting up with a lot of BS like some of those cars do. And so that's the Bugatti Chiron Super Sport. This is an amazing car, a hyper car with incredible performance and power and speed, but also amazing luxury. This might just be the very best hyper car combining everything you could possibly want, except there's one drawback and that would be the price tag, which is absolutely astronomical, but incredibly cool car. I'm thrilled I had the chance to check it out, and now it's time to give the Chiron Super Sport a Doug score. And the Doug score is here, 73 out of 100, which won't surprise frequent viewers of my hypercar videos because every single Chiron and Chiron derivative I've reviewed has gotten a 73 out of 100. The truth is these cars do have differences, but they're not exceptional. One is a bit faster, one handles a bit better, but for most people's driving, they're all roughly the same. And that's a good thing because I truly believe the Chiron is one of the most impressive cars ever made, Super Sport included. 